Hello, and welcome to The Mind Report. I'm Tamar Gendler from Yale University. And I'm Angela Duckworth from University of Pennsylvania. And it's a great pleasure to have Angela here with us on The Mind Report today. Angela is doing some of the most interesting translational work that I know of. Translational work means work that takes findings from empirical psychology in a theoretical vein and translates them directly into practice that affects people's everyday lives. And the area where Angela works primarily is on what it is that helps children succeed in school. But the results that she makes use of are some of the deepest and most important results in cognitive science. In particular, Angela works on translating the ways that the famous marshmallow task, a measure of self-regulation, can help children in, or the results of the marshmallow task, can help us understand what helps children succeed in school. So Angela, I wonder whether you'd start for listeners to the Mind Report by telling them a bit about the historic marshmallow task and more particularly about the modern versions of it that you use in your own work. Thanks so much, Tamar. So the marshmallow test is a, is a measure of self-control in children. It was invented by a then young psychologist named Walter Michel, who was at Stanford University, and interested in trying to measure what Freud had identified as the chief developmental milestone, the transition between childhood and adulthood, Freud said, was the ability to take our impulses for immediate gratification, whatever those may be, you know, wanting to drink something at the time, wanting to eat something at the time, wanting to say something that would bring reward or relief, and being able to suppress those impulses or manage them so that they could be uh, uh, demonstrated or acted upon at the appropriate, at the best time, and that wasn't always right now, right here. So that idea, which had been, you know, acknowledged, as you know, far, far earlier in human history than just Freud's own work, um, presented a challenge to psychologists that Walter Michel solved. He said, you know, how am I going to measure the ability for children to do this, particularly when they're not in an age where you can just ask them, you know, for example, to fill out a questionnaire. So what he identified was that at age four, children could be given a simple choice between something that they want right here and right now and something even better that would require them to delay gratification. And the test is not whether or not you can choose the larger deferred reward, but in fact, how long you can wait for it. So children at age four are sat in a simple, uh, very plain room where there aren't a lot of distractions, and they're given a choice of their treats. They choose their favorite ones, most famously marshmallows, but in our own work, Oreos seem to be the modal choice. Um, and then they're given two piles, one small pile and one larger pile of treats, and presented with the choice, which one of these would you rather have? the small pile right now or the larger pile when I come back into the room I have to get something in the hallway and do some things. Now universally children choose the larger pile of rewards and insist that they're able to wait for the experimenter to come back and the task is how many seconds will elapse before the child you know breaks down and you know either just eats the first one or rings a bell to bring the experimenter back to have the smaller pile. So you uh, have translated this work to make use of it with older children. What do you do with older children? Do you use marshmallows or do you use other sorts of things? Well, we have actually replicated this delay task, not with four-year-olds, but with 10-year-olds. The problem being that the older the child gets, the longer you have to extend the wait time, right? Because you have to wait for kids to give up. And with the 10-year-olds that we were testing, you know, we already extended it to half an hour, which is roughly double what Walter typically used. And uh, even then, you had kids who were waiting all the way to the end. So one modification of this task is to give kids uh, a choice. Um, we did the same thing as, you know, smaller reward now versus larger later. But the question is not what they say that they'll do, but what they behaviorally do. Uh, so we've done $1 right now. The kids hold it in their hands. This works from uh, about age 10 all the way up to age 7. Uh, and if you choose to have it right now, great, you can go out to the food trucks, you can buy whatever you want right after school, or you can give us back the dollar, so that requires the kids to put the dollar in an envelope, everyone passes their envelope forward, if the envelope is empty with their name on it, then they get nothing, if their envelope is filled with their dollar, then they get, in the case of the kids that we first piloted this worth, two dollars in a week.
um, and variants of thereof uh, seem to work. They're not quite as precise as the marshmallow task, uh, but they do give you variability that corresponds to teacher ratings and self-control and parent ratings, etc. Okay, so the basic structure of the marshmallow task is you have a choice between a smaller reward sooner and a larger reward later. That's great, but what other things seem to correlate with the ability to wait a longer time for the larger later reward? Well, the reason why that task has captured the imagination, not only of researchers, but, you know, everyone on, on up to the current president, is because it really does predict uh, a variety of life outcomes, all of the outcomes I think that we would universally say are important. So let's start with academic achievement. The marshmallow task correlates with SAT scores years later, more than a decade later, after Walter first studied his four-year-olds, he followed up and found out that, you know, at least in the subsample where he had, uh, SAT scores that the correlation was not only there and positive, but really strong, right? So that was one um, uh, piece of evidence. In a larger replication study, the federal government actually tested over a thousand children using the same Walter Michelle paradigm and found that, again, it predicted uh, standardized test scores that the government themselves, uh, you know, gave to the kids. It also predicts things like your high school grades from your official school records. So we know that this is a predictor of academic achievement. We find that in our own work, whether using the dollar bill test that I just described to you or just teacher ratings of how self-controlled kids are in the classroom, parent ratings, self-report ratings. So self-control is a terrific predictor of academic performance, whether you're measuring it through test scores or through grades. Uh, the other things that uh, the, the delay task predicts, as well as other self-control measures like questionnaires, are your physical health. So one thing that's a terrific uh, indicator of your long-term physical health is your BMI, your, your body mass index. Are you, are you a healthy weight or are you an unhealthy weight? Uh, and particularly as kids transition into adolescence where they are in control of their own food choices, not just what mom and dad will let me eat, but what I choose to regulate in my intake myself. So, so self-control also predicts that. Um, it also predicts um, risk-taking behavior in the direction that you would expect. So kids are higher in self-control, do fewer stupid things when they are in adolescence, like uh, driving too fast, you know, drinking too much, trying drugs that, you know, have long-term uh, negative outcomes, uh, doing things that are law-breaking, etc. So across the sort of social, physical, and academic outcomes, uh, we know that self-control is, is a good predictor of positive functioning in adolescence, and there have even been studies that have extended into adulthood, the most famous being a study done by Temi Moffitt and collaborators showing that if you measure self-control in childhood and follow people up into their 30s, every possible life outcome that you can imagine, crime, employment, earnings, physical health, mental health, self-control is as good a predictor as IQ or socioeconomic status. So can you give me a sense of why that would be? What is it about the sort of self-control skills that we see in, in Michelle's case, the four-year-old, in your case, the 10-year-old, that would be such an important predictor of life success 20, 30, even 50 years out? I think all this recent empirical evidence confirms Freud's intuitions, which is that as we mature into adulthood, we are faced with innumerable conflicts between what we want to do right here and right now that would make me feel good and what would be better for me in, our, in my long-term uh, self-interest. So this, this explains why, you know, people are of a healthier body weight, because frankly, it feels better to eat, you know, every last Dorito in the bag and, you know, instead of having a salad for lunch, having a burger and french fries with a milkshake. And I think that in every domain in academics, uh, children that we survey, if you, for example, randomly beat kids and say, what are you doing right now? Uh, and then you ask them to rate that activity according to how it feels, but also how important it is for their long-term goals. Kids who are girls, boys, uh, rural kids, urban kids, straight A kids, kids who are failing, kids rate that experience in the following way. 
what I'm doing right now when it's schoolwork is not fun and I'd rather be doing other things. It's not immediately gratifying, but I recognize that it's important for my long-term interests. So that's academia. In terms of the social risk factors like cigarette smoking and risk taking that I mentioned, you know, a lot of those things feel good right now. I want to have a cigarette. I want to try this thing. I want to see what it's like to go past 75 miles per hour. But there's some recognition, even at the moment when you're committing that act of impulsivity, that probably you're going to regret it later. But of course, that's the future. So I think Freud was essentially right. Um, and there are very few competencies that are that universally um, applicable because, you know, th the self control dilemma, I think, so aptly characterizes uh, so many things where we have a kind of right here, right now versus, you know, my future me conflict. So you speak of it as a competency, but I wonder whether you can say a bit more about the opera, the sort of operational manifestation of that competency. So what are the things you see in those four-year-olds? What are the skills that they have? And how do those manifest themselves later in life? One of Walter Michelle's most important insights was that the children who are able to wait longer in the marshmallow task weren't just doing it by kind of, you know, strongly suppressing their impulses to eat the first treat, the immediate one that was available. And I think the word willpower kind of suggests that it's just a matter of, you know, gritting your teeth and getting through things. So what Walter observed is even at age four, children have strategies. And I think that is one of the most promising directions for research now, to identify the strategies that more functional children or adults use so that we can, of course, teach them to folks who wouldn't have spontaneously figured them out and practiced them on their own. Going back to the four-year-olds in Walter's studies, he, he um, identified, for example, that some of the children who waited the longest would do this. They would just turn their backs away from the treats, or they would cover their eyes. And Walter at first was wondering, you know, what are these kids doing? Then it became clear to him, out of sight, out of mind. So to make the marshmallows go away effectively, one could make them go away visually. So uh, he uh, and others have subsequently identified that what would be called strategic attention deployment, sort of putting your eyes or your attention where it will be uh, easier for you as opposed to harder to delay gratification. That's one strategy. Another class of strategies that Walter identified from those little four-year-olds on videotape is a cognitive transformation. Not looking away physically, but transforming the mental representation of the temptation to be something that is easier to uh, with you know uh, you know wait for versus not. So uh, one of the things that he did was he had kids do this. In half of the kids in a certain cohort, he said, you know. If you want to, when you want to, you can pretend that the marshmallow is just a picture. You can put a frame around it like this. The other kids were left to their own devices. The kids who simply put a frame around it pretended it was a picture or, in other experiments, pretended it was a fluffy white cloud, etc. These kids were able to wait dramatically longer than the kids left to their own devices. So either paying selective attention to certain things in our environment versus, uh, you know, things that are going to be more tempting, or transforming things mentally, those are two classes of strategies that are very important. And I'll just mention another class of strategies because it's even better, probably, than either of those two, and that is to avoid the temptation altogether. Now, in the delay paradigm where the kids are sitting at the desk in an empty room, there's nothing else that they can do. So they're, they're not able to avoid this dilemma. But many of us who, for example, are on diets or exercise regimes or trying to quit smoking, we can choose our situations in ways that will be you know, entirely better for us. So if we are struggling to avoid uh, carbohydrates or you know junky foods, then we can you know go to certain grocery stores that you know have fewer of those things, or avoid the path home by the bakery. If we're trying to quit smoking, we can not exit the building by the vestibule where all the smokers hang out. You know, situation selection as a strategy is probably the most powerful because you can avoid certain uh, temptations altogether. It's interesting, though, that that falls in your mind under the category of self-regulation because in a sort of natural way of thinking about things, that's avoiding the need for self-regulation. But it sounds like one of the thoughts you have is that one strategy for self-regulation in a larger sense is figuring out how to structure your life in such a way that you avoid the need for self-regulation in a, in a local sense. Is that an accurate characterization? 
That's an absolutely accurate characterization. I mean, the self-control dilemma that leaps to mind doesn't have to do with four-year-olds, but say an adult who has been arrested multiple times for DUI, right? And, you know, you can say to that person, well, let's let's sort of try to diagnose this failure of self-control. I would argue that the failure of self-control is not just located at the moment where they get behind the wheel and they're drunk, right? You could argue that, you know, antecedent to that, in time, there was the decision to drink too much. And antecedent to that, there was the decision to go to a party where there are going to be a lot of drinks served. And antecedent to that was, you know, choosing to take the car keys or, you know, choosing to drive. I think that what we need to do is extend backward in time, you know, all the many decisions that lead us to our face-to-face confrontations with self-control and say, those decisions that led up to that final act of resistance are both our responsibility and also our opportunity uh, to take action that, uh, again, is in our best interest. I want to go back to something that you said in your remarks about Michelle and the four-year-olds, where you described an instruction that he gave to half of the kids. And you said he pointed out to half of the kids roughly this, here's a way of dealing with the problem of self-control. Take something that feels very salient to yourself and produce a degree of psychological distance from it by making use of a capacity you have, namely imagination. Now, presumably, the kids who were in that group are some of the kids who went in the meta-analysis into the category of people who waited for a long time. But those weren't kids who naturally came up with that strategy. Those were kids who were taught the strategy. So that raises the issue, which I think is central to your work, which is to what extent can these strategies for self-regulation be taught? And are people to whom the strategies are taught, as opposed to people from whom they emerge naturally, equally capable of achieving these astronomically good outcomes that you describe? So that is the question in self-control research, right? So, you know, you can put together these various findings and say, well, if I think about this as a collective whole, this evidence base suggests to me that we should be able to teach people self-control strategies, make them more self-controlled, have them apply these strategies to the various idiosyncratic dilemmas that they are facing in their own lives and make you know society better off. Well, we're a long way from verifying whether that in fact is true, but let me tell you what we do know. So subsequent to Walter's early studies, and again, these were conducted in the 60s and the 70s, uh, he had a number of graduate students who continued this work, and one of them at uh, University of Michigan named Ethan Cross has shown that in random assignment studies, you can give people, not just four-year-olds, but older people like college students and you know people who are older than college students, people who are younger than college students, these strategies. And in short-term uh, situations, you, know, you give them the strategy and then relatively soon after, you give them uh, an emotion regulation challenge, for example. Uh, you conjure up an angry memory and see whether they're able to regulate their emotion, process the information, and not just be reactive, uh, which is what many of us do in an emotion situation. Uh, He's been able to show that, you know, for example, inducing psychological distance or teaching the psychological distance strategy actually does help people regulate emotion. But that's a far cry from then showing, A, that that person, when they're having an argument with their girlfriend, two weeks later is going to use psychological distance as a strategy effectively, and B, whether two years later or four years later, uh, that there would be any residual effect of showing that person that emotion regulation strategy. And I would argue that, that as promising as the research findings are right now, we still have not proven that there is generalization across life situations or that there is stability of these uh, strategies once taught you know, in time. And, uh, and in fact, I would argue that that extends far beyond the self-control literature, that in psychology generally, uh, we haven't quite figured out why it is and when it is that people will generalize across transfer is what it's called, right? Transfer across situations or whether any of the things that we would teach them, you know, cognitive therapy for depression, it's like, you know, when do they in fact maintain effects in the very long term and, and for the subset of individuals who do, you know, why that is. And in fact, it's not just a question, as I know you realize, for psychology in the practitioner sense. It's also a question for developmental psychology more generally. The question of learning. So some of Susan Golden Meadows' incredible work about the ways in which children can acquire a mathematical skill in one domain and then show a complete inability for a period of time to transfer it to another domain where for an adult they seem to be structurally identical is a way in which the 
problem of transfer provides us with a really interesting window into cognitive science, which is, of course, the unifying theme of mind reports. So in some sense, the fact that the question of transfer is a problem is itself something interesting for cognitive science. But it sounds like the Michelle longitudinal work suggests that at least with regard to people for whom self-regulation of a certain kind comes naturally, there is this kind of transfer, at least across the domains that we are measuring in those studies. So ability to delay gratification on food seems to translate in some people into ability to regulate behavior with regard to academic success. Has there been work on the transfer of that, for instance, to interpersonal relations? Do we know whether there's better stability in that domain uh, in the yeah, Michelle? Let's First, let me say that when, when Walter shows that a little child waiting for a larger treat is able to wait longer and that that predicts a large and diverse array of life outcomes for that child, one inference would be that, oh, well, that, that child's use of this strategy transfers across, you know, they're, they're able to use selective attention not only when they're waiting for food, but also when they're trying to control their temper, et cetera. Um, it may not be necessarily that mechanism is one thing I would say. For example, maybe those children just have better executive function. Maybe the front part of their brain is just better response inhibition, and there's nothing strategic going on. It's something else. So, um, so I think the jury is still out to some extent about, you know, confirming that it really is strategies that accounts for the, the transfer or the generalization of, um, of self-control across life domains. Um, that said, uh, one thing that we know from our own research, I've, I've been personally fascinated by uh, both the idea of transfer and its opposite, which is uh, domain specificity, for example, right? You know, a, a, a child or an adult is able to be self-controlled in one domain of their life and then radically impulsive in another, right? And we can all sort of chuckle about this because I think we can look in our own lives and say, oh yeah, for example, with me, and then rattle off the sort of domains in which we are self-controlled and those in which we seem to kind of fall down. And in fact, that's actually what our data suggests. So when we survey either children or adults, and we give them a laundry list of impulsive behaviors. So for adults, you know, uh, buying things that you immediately regret, um, you know, uh, not saving for later, you know, eating too much, even at the moment that you're eating, you kind of know that you shouldn't be eating that. Um, avoiding exercise, procrastinating on your work, uh, losing your temper at a loved one. So we have this sort of list, we used to call it the seven deadly sin list, but it turns out there aren't exactly seven different domains. There's probably something like eight to 10. Um, you can ask the question, now are adults who are impulsive in one of these domains, right, say their finances, are they also impulsive in another domain like exercise? And here's the answer that we find, yes, but. So there is a correlation. People who are more impulsive in their finances are, on average, slightly more likely to also be slothful when it comes to exercise. But the correlation is pretty weak, is the first observation. So, you know, you can make bets, but, you know, you're going to lose the bet a lot of the time, even if you win on average. And the second thing is, when you look at variability across individuals in their overall self-control, right? Is Tamar a self-controlled person and is she more or less self-controlled than Angela? You will find that there is some variability there. That's what Walter found with the four-year-olds looking at their life outcomes. It's like some four-year-olds on average are a little more impulsive or self-controlled than others. And that's the domain general piece that we're looking at. But then if you ask the question, will within Tamar, right? Within an individual across their eight to 10 life domains that we identify, is there variability? And there we find, yes, there's tremendous variability. And in fact, we find that there's more variability within a person across their various life domains than there are between individuals. So it's to say that, you know, it's fine and well to take that marshmallow task and make some, some claims and to wonder about general self-control, but there's more variability within us. Uh, and so then the question is, you know, why that is, and, and, uh, and we're doing a little work into that. But, but um, yes, there is a correlation across your life. There is some transfer, but there is a lot more variability than there is uh, gen domain generality. Interesting, interesting. So I know you've been spending a lot of time studying these issues, and I wonder whether you talk about, you already adverted to one of the really interesting studies, which is the degree to which within subjects there's as much, if not more, difference as there is between subjects. What are some of the other things that you've discovered in your work, maybe two or three of the most exciting results? 
Yeah, for me, one of the um, interesting and somewhat surprising findings was that uh, life stress, you know, negative life events that are frankly beyond your control, you know, your parents are splitting up or your best friend moved away or, uh, you know, somebody got shot that you know, uh, that these events at time one precipitate declines in self-control between time one and time two. So children, for example, who suddenly start acting out, suddenly start acting impulsively, you know, their behavior becomes dysregulated, either their attention, their emotion, or, you know, what they're doing, their actions. Um, that often, I think, is the case uh, where it's not just that the kid has dropped in trait level self-control, but in fact, something in their life is going on which is precipitating it. And from an evolutionary point of view, and I will bracket the fact that obviously all evolutionary explanations have the caveat that, you know, we can make up just so stories and so forth. But I do think it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view that when you are in an environment that you perceive to be threatening and uncertain, eat the first marshmallow, do what you, you know, spontaneously and reactively feel is the right thing because, frankly, you don't have a lot of time uh, to do otherwise and there's not a lot of confidence in the long term, so act in your short-term interest. So for us, when we saw that finding again and again, by the way, in longitudinal study after longitudinal study, using various kinds of measures, using different kinds of samples, including a national sample, it confirmed to us that at least it's plausible to consider that kids are, in fact, acting rationally with respect to their their environmental inputs. Um, so from a dispassionate observer point of view, you're thinking, well, that kid's not doing what's in their best interest, but from their subjective point of view, they may be. So do you think alerting people to the fact that that pattern exists could be helpful? And have you done any interventional work of that kind? So letting people know, one of the standard results of stress is a loss of self-regulation on the smaller, sooner, larger, later axis. And just letting people know that or reminding them of strategies. Yeah, we would like to. In fact, our, our study on stress and self-control just came out, so so we're eager to do more in that direction. I mean, right there at Yale, you have Amy Arnston, who you yeah. know really pioneered that work, particularly in animals as well. So I guess we're adding our voice to the chorus of this. Um, the nuances here are, are hard to explain because we, what we want to, communi to be, communicate to people is that there could be a short-term effect. That's what we're finding in our studies. We're looking at six-month time periods, et cetera. But there's also very powerful research suggesting that if chronic stress is the is the life story for these kids, it may not be a you know temporary aberration. Mm -hmm. It could be, in fact, you know, contributing this life stress to their to their trait level self control. So the nuanced message that we want to tell people is that stress is bad, uh, both for its potential acute effects in the short term, but also for its potential chronic and permanent effects in the long term. Um, and I would say that there is an you know stress itself is I think one of the most exciting topics because we're we're now discovering not only its kind of subjective uh, effects on how we feel, but its effects on the brain and long term development. But I do think the compassionate insight that lies behind what you said earlier, this idea that one of the things that stress does is makes rational a kind of short-term response to things, really for me is transformative in my picture of how I think about those kinds of experiences. And I would imagine articulating that to those who had undergone stress would be similarly transformative in terms of self-understanding. Um, I, I, I agree, but I will tell you as a parent, sometimes I think to myself, well, you know, from what I know as a psychologist, most of human behavior is, in fact, rational yeah. under the framework of the subjective, uh, you know, the person who's propagating these behaviors. It's very hard to remember as an exasperated parent or I'm sure teacher or counselor, you know, that, that fact. But, but I agree. At least we can start from there and try to remind ourselves that, you know, the kid who's, you know, driving us crazy is driving us crazy for reasons that make sense to the kid. In fact, I mean, that's an instance of the phenomenon you're describing, which is when you're the parent interacting with the disastrously behaving kid, your experience subjectively is that it is entirely rational <laughs> yes, to, to respond with the kind of outrage that involves the removal of a cell phone from somebody's life for the next 20 Forever. years. Forever. Yes, exactly. We're there. obviously on the, on the same parenting book. Yeah, uh, I think 
I think that, you know, we like to um, belittle the economists, right? We like to say, like, oh, ha-ha, the economists had this rational agent model, and we now know post-behavioral economics and post-psychology that they were wrong, wrong, wrong. And I think, actually, they were mostly right if you understand rationality as being bounded. So, you know, I like to say that maybe we don't have a rational agent model, but we have a sane model of human behavior. I think we should all start from the premise that, you know, most human behavior is... Is, is sane, if not, you know, optimal, uh, and, and it's sane in that, you know, people are responding to their environment in ways that, you know, they are trying to, you know, do what's, uh, what they think at the moment is, is best for them. It, it's interesting because this idea of this kind of subjectively rational behavior actually lies at the heart of a quasi-behaviorist philosophical picture from the 50s and 60s, where what one engaged in was called radical interpretation, which was the assumption that whatever somebody was doing was a response to their representation of experience. So it isn't purely behaviorist, it's a response to a representation, but there's a way in which there was something deeply right about that earlier insight in the same way that it's at the heart of, of traditional economics. Um, yep. And as long as we recognize that what the response is to is to a subjective representation, then That's I think cheap. we can combine the cognitivist insight with the behaviorist insight. Um, so, so that's one really interesting study that you've done. What's what's a second since that one was so fruitful? I'll let you. I'll <laughs> let you try. You hit that one. Try again. Well, let's see. Uh, I'll just mention two things. Uh, one is a particular finding, and the other one is a whole direction of findings. Uh, the first one is the girls versus boys. So when I was first doing this research, I was, you know, analyzing my data like a good, assiduous little graduate student, and I noticed that the girls' grades in all of my school records were higher than the boys. And then I looked at math, and I thought, well, there you're going to get the reversal. Nope, even in the math classes, and in fact, even in the advanced math classes, so the highest level of math classes in the schools where I was studying. So I went and I contacted the the Philadelphia School District and the records person said, oh, that's the case for every school in Philadelphia. Boy valedictorians outnumber, uh, sorry, girl valedictorians outnumber boys two to one, and this is a perennial pattern, something I had never heard of. So it turns out our research has affirmed that, in fact, this is true, but more than that, that trait-level self-control, a slight advantage favoring girls throughout development, actually in part explains girls' higher functioning in many domains, including academic domains. So that's one finding that, um, that I guess I found personally interesting because I think there's so much headline uh, news about, you know, boys slightly outdoing girls in SAT scores. That is true. But when you look at grades where self-control helps you more because you have more opportunities to exert effort uh, and otherwise increase your performance through sort of deliberate activities, uh, that you have a gender reversal. Mm -hmm. So leaving that aside, the other thing that we're excited about is an entire direction of research, and that is intervention. Uh, and we have been uh, trying with some success, you know, many failures, but some success, you know, trying to teach kids strategies that we know to be effective and, and, uh, and used by highly self-controlled people, uh, and, and then teaching them to the rest of the kids. Uh, the one strategy we're really excited about, and you can ask me more about if you want to know, is a goal setting and planning, which is a, a way of actually taking an intention like, mm -hmm. I want to do my homework more, and uh, and then actually carrying through on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you want to say a little bit about how one translates intentions into practice? Because I am somebody with a long list of <laughs> intentions, uh, and I'd love to know how to translate them into practice. Well, I think the first thing to, to tell people about self-control is that it's not really, to me, so much a motivational competence as a volitional competence. And when people ask me, well, what do you mean? What's the difference between motivation and volition? It really all turns on the idea that there are many things that we want to do, and in fact that we resolve with every fiber of our being to do, and yet fail to do, right? So, you know, uh, guilty as charged for, for all of us, uh, maybe the easiest example is, you know, people who resolve to lose weight, who really, really sincerely want to eat healthier and get more exercise and reverse some of the trends, you know, we're obviously becoming a fatter and fatter nation. I don't think it's because we want to be a fatter and fatter nation. Uh, so the, what's the problem? The problem is not a motivational problem. The problem is, in fact, a volitional one. Motivation is wanting things, having goals for things um, that, you know, are sort of deeply rooted. Volition is carrying those out. 
And uh, inspired by the work by Peter Golwitzer and Gabrielle Ettingen, two of my collaborators at NYU, uh, we've been doing studies where people start with goals, and they are then randomly assigned to two conditions. In one condition, they do what many of us do spontaneously, which is to kind of positively fantasize about them. Like, well, if I lost weight then, you know, I would fit into my old jeans, and, you know, I would just feel better about my, my husband would think I were hotter, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that really goes nowhere, though, because that doesn't actually lead you to action. In the intervention group, we then ask people, after they sort of fantasize about all the things that would happen if they achieved their goal, to identify the specific obstacles that stand in the way, which actually takes people a little mental work. It's, it's fascinating to find even, you know, highly educated people who, when you sit down and ask them, well, like, why haven't you, you know, done anything about your diet or, you know, answered your email that you say that you want to answer or what have you, um, they actually haven't sat down in a quiet moment, reflected upon the obstacles that stand in the way. And then Finally, they make a plan, an if-then plan, if cue, then action verb. This is where they specify if, when, and where, or if trigger cue, you know, if I see my, you know, 14-year-old son, then I will say, you know, what did you do at school today? If I, you know, am given a dessert menu at the restaurant, then I will say, no, thank you. You know, this kind of um, prospective plan making that you then rehearse uh, and troubleshoot, like, oh, you know what, that's not really going to work. I'm not going to be able to turn down the dessert. Okay, well, maybe I need to do something else. Maybe I need to avoid the situation altogether, et cetera. But they finally come up with a plan that they can commit to. They write it down, they rehearse it. And that kind of plan making, it's not a miracle. It's not like everybody will do exactly what they said, but it really dramatically increases the probability that people will do what they intend to do. So it bridges that mot motivational, I should say, that volitional gap. In our random assignment studies, we're able to teach this in a matter of minutes, really, to school-age children reading at a third grade level and to increase, at least over a marking period, their school record grades, attendance, and teacher ratings blind to condition of their classroom behavior. Uh, in other research with adults and, and all around the world, really, this has been shown to be one of the most powerful self-control strategies there are. And as I say, it's, it's quite simple. So it sounds like it has two parts, one of which is the sort of perspective imagining of the situations in which you'll find yourself. And it's completely obvious to me why that would work. And I think uh, interesting, uh, but not so cognitively interesting, though it does require a certain kind of imagination and perspective. And what really interests me as a cognitive scientist is this question of how and why implementation intentions work. So it sounds like what they do is allow you to have available at a moment something that's there dispositionally, but it's as if you forgot, usually you forget to bring it. So, you know, it's like getting to the swimming pool and realizing, oh, I forgot my bathing suit again. <laughs> this is a way of guaranteeing that your bathing suit is with you when you get to the swimming pool. And the idea of specifying what it is that the cue that causes the inappropriate response is um, seems an incredible strategy. But do you have any insight into how it is that given that there's a standard response to the cue, usually when I see my 14-year-old son, I ignore him or I say to him, have you done your goddamn homework? Right? <laughs> what is it that's going to allow me to replace that standard behavior with the desired behavior just as a result of this kind of perspective? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Peter Goldwitzer's work and Gabrielle Engine, by the way, they are married couples, so a lot of their work is done uh, collaboratively, um, reveal something about the mechanisms here. You know, the, what they're really doing is they're kind of um, hijacking the neural architecture that is typically used for habitual and automatic behaviors, right? You know, when someone, you know, extends their hand, then I extend my hand, right? It doesn't take any kind of... Um, thinking, right? You, you know, they do this, then I do that, right? You see a red light, then you stop. You know, you want to slow down the car, then you hit the, 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 you know, the right pedal. So these kind of habitual actions that we know, we have the capacity to do that neurally, and they're trying to sort of, in a way, hijack that uh, so that you can say, okay, well, how would I intentionally create an automatic habitual behavior? Um, you know, the first thing I should mention, as I, as I um, alluded to, is that it's not a miracle. So it's not that I can teach people how to use this technique, and then, you know, for sure, they will definitely 
definitely in the moment, you know, but it does increase likelihood. What you do is you actually rehearse these things in advance and you are able to, you know, at least uh, tip the balance, I think, right? So that you can start to, you know, tip the balance from one kind of automatic behavior towards a more intended, um, sort of more adaptive, uh, you know, rival behavior. And I think all this sort of mental rehearsal in advance, you know, writing it down, uh, visualizing it, you know, trying to be more specific. Okay, um, you know, like I'm not just saying if it is Tuesday at six o'clock, then I will call my mother-in-law. I'm visualizing where I'll be. Um, let's see, I'll be in the kitchen. I'll be picking up the yellow phone. You know, this kind of thing actually, and it, again, sort of like makes it more probable that when in that trigger situation, you know, you're able to, you know, at least pause and then initiate the desired action sequence. And that sort of mental rehearsal is, of course, familiar from almost every therapeutic technique that I can think of. It's there in CBT, but it's very much there in a psychoanalytic tradition and in everything in between. This idea, so in some sense, it's the inverse of the original Michelle strategy, where you use imagination to distance. This is a way of using imagination to make something more vivid. And I guess, given the earlier picture we were talking about, which is that what people respond to is not the world, but their mental representation of the world, then here's the clue to how to change your strategies. Change your mental representation. Um, exactly. And I think that's what, what you said is sort of like, in a way, this is the opposite. Here's what they have in common. Both of these strategies sort of like, oh, I'm going to look away, or I'm going to think about it as something which is very distant, or this plan. They're both metacognitive. They're so both mm -hmm. kind of, you know, you taking control of your own mental operations. And I think that is one thing that is a common theme in all, all the self-control strategies that, that we identify as being effective. They're always the individual having some awareness of how their machine you know, their own user manual, and then sort of trying to use that knowledge in strategic ways to, uh, you know, to go in the right direction. If I'm remembering right, there's non-human animal work that suggests that non-human animals all the way to pigeons are in fact capable of this sort of pre-commitment. Um, so if I'm remembering right, pigeons discover of themselves that if a reward is salient, they will take a smaller sooner as opposed to a larger later. And that they are willing to peck in a way that will prevent them from having a later choice when they discover that pattern. Is, has that work held up, that pigeon work? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about Ainsley's work and, and Howard yeah. Racklin. I at least remember reading about this in uh, Racklin's Excellent Signs of Self-Control. Oh, which is incredible book. Just great, right? You know, you, you, it's like a beach read. You, yeah, you should all read it immediately. Uh, so in, in animal work, for example, with pigeons, you can, for example, train pigeons to peck at a lever that will make it impossible for them to, you know, then get access to a second choice where they would be able to, you know, take a sooner reward. So in a way, it's like a, it's like an alcoholic locking up the liquor cabinet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't think what's been shown is that in, in nature that pigeons will spontaneously do this, but you can create experimental situations where they're at least able to react in ways that look like pre-commitment. Um, similarly, with little kids, you know, you can maybe um, get kids to do things like uh, if you give kids a strategy, this isn't exactly pre-commitment, but if you give kids a strategy while they're doing a self-control task, one of Walter's early paradigms was not waiting for a marshmallow, but doing a boring work task while something he called Mr. Clownbox sat next and tried to distract you, right? So Mr. Clownbox would have flashing lights and would say things like, come over here and look in my ear, or, you know, I have a new toy for you. And kids given a yeah, plan. Yeah, this is Mr. Clownbox for me, right? This is my <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, Silicon Valley has created innumerable permutations of Mr. Clownbox. And in fact, I think that's, you know, I'm not just being facetious. I think yeah, no, no, I think that is Mr. Clownbox, quite literally. But anyway, go on and tell me what the four-year-olds did, because I need help, man. Right. Okay, so this is what worked for the four-year-olds. If given a plan, you know, if Mr. Clownbox comes and says something that will make you distracted, then you say to Mr. Clownbox, I'm working right now, leave me alone, right? So he gave these kids plans. But like the pigeons, it's not clear that they would have come up with those plans. They can use them when they're given the strategy, but, you know, the question, the great leap is, you know, can people do this of their own accord in the situations that they need to? And that's, I think, the work that needs to be done. Walter tells me that when he was a um, middle-aged psychologist, not a very young one, and, and he had clearly demonstrated that self-control was a competence that was important across a range of domains, and that it looked like these things were teachable from a strategic point of view, that we could actually equip kids with strategies that would be more effective. He went to the New York City public schools and asked whether anybody wanted to do research in the 
answer was a resounding no. Uh, and I think that uh, we're now hearing, at least from where I sit, educators saying uh, that was that was the wrong thing. That educators should have been paying attention to these quote unquote non cognitive competencies all along. And and at least from 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 this lab's point of view, there are more and more school partners who are willing to you know engage in that uh, tedious. Uh, delay of gratification work itself, right? You know, do a bunch of studies and maybe a long time later, you know, have a result that, that could actually be helpful in the classroom. It's interesting because, of course, this was traditionally central to education. And in part, I think, because character development was seen as none of school's business, it got removed from the school conversation. But in fact, it sounds to me like it's a pretty non-political goal to be engaged in, that this isn't character development that's owned either by the right or by the left. Uh, I think where the, where the right and left differ, and they differ vigorously, is what to call it. Yes. So social and emotional learning or character or soft skills, the economists like the term non-cognitive skills, the psychologists hate that term because they, you know, like, what does that mean to be non-cognitive? So there's a, there's a vigorous debate, completely unresolved, and I would argue, you know, a debate that will never be resolved about what to call it, but where there's real consensus that these competencies are important. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you that in the long history of, of formal schooling, they've always been important, you know, early Earlier than even American, uh, you know, you can you can find quotes by Dewey and William James and Benjamin Franklin about how this was part and parcel of formal education's mission. But of course, as you know, going much farther back in history than that, uh, it's been affirmed that that children will not. I think the key here is that children are not expected to just grow into these things. It's not like height that if you just keep eating, you'll grow. Uh, it's, it's actually that as human beings, we need to learn from other human beings and often from older human beings about how to do these things well. Yeah, I mean, in fact, in some ways, the theme of the two classic ancient Greek works of education, Plato's Republic and Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, is this idea that what intellectual development requires as a precondition is a sort of acculturation of character into the capacity to allow reason to take the reins when it needs it and to allow passions to be shaped in such a way that given that they usually are running the show, they're responsive to the things to which one's reflectively committed. So in some sense, you're doing the newest work in the world and the oldest work in the world all, all at the same time. Any closing words for our Mind Report listeners since we're coming up on our time limit? Well, I would just say that many acts of parenting, from you know, from from where a lot of us sit, you know, the way we process all this information is, what am I going to do when I get home tonight? Um, I would say that, in a very real sense, parenting itself is a self-control dilemma because what. Mm -hmm does the work in the moment to alleviate our distress, uh, to allay our guilt, to make us feel like, you know, our kids like us, to, you know, calm the house down, to make it possible to have a reasonable dinner conversation, those things often are, frankly, in the short term gratifying, like, oh, what the hell, let them watch TV, or, you know, give them back their iPod, or, you know, postpone that difficult conversation. And in the long term, you may have this, you know, nagging sense, uh, and sometimes we are good at ignoring it, but in the long term, oftentimes, uh, it, it's something that's not that. So I think uh, just to think about parenting as both um, uh, a, a task in which you are trying to control and develop self-control in your children, but also a task which itself demands uh, the ability to resist immediate gratification. Fantastic. Thanks so much to Angela D. Lee Duckworth from the University of Pennsylvania. Great. Goodbye, Angela. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah.